I'm John Gage. In today's program, we will explore the design of small objects, objects for human use, objects for human touch, objects that blur the distinction between hardware and software. Today's explosion of creativity comes at the intersection of two different worlds, the world of product design and the world of computer and sensor design. The past five years have seen an explosion in internet use. The next five years will see the amazing expansion of embedded devices, these devices that create new objects for human use. Here in Japan, where space is at a premium, the Japanese have learned to create entire worlds in miniature. Miniaturization means that in a small space, you must not disrupt the environment. So you can't have large trees in Japan, not in the space you have in your home. You can have it in a park, of course, but not too many parks. So you miniaturize the trees, that's the one side. We've come to Japan to see how this island nation's distinctive culture informs its ability to make products that are smaller, lighter, and faster products that change the way we do business and our lifestyle. Japanese garden, very small garden, eh? A small garden, but there are were, there were some uh, pond uh, with a big cup. Eh? People want to grab the, the universe on their own plows. Eh? So that's why it's making everything making this smaller and smaller. With technology, even a household pet can be miniaturized and become a fad among children worldwide. This is called Tamagotchi, and I understand it's also catching on in the United States. And I think it fulfills the frustration of a kid not having a little dog or a little cat or a pet in many Japanese homes. So it's all like, almost like the bonsai. The Japanese are fascinated by technology uh, because they don't see technology as a threat. They see it simply as a next stage in, in transition from one natural state to another. It's almost part of nature. If a children's toy like the Tamagotchi can contain a small computer, then so can other common household objects. This presents new opportunities for technologists and industrial designers. That's the reason for the explosion of interest in this year's Java Expo at Tokyo's futuristic big site complex. The big news is how new streamlined software can result in the creation of small objects with new purposes. As we discover the basic laws that exist in nature, technology evolves. For example, it has become possible to use software like Java to express things in a small size. That is, the use of the bytecode. One piece of code is extremely eloquent. The concept of a multi-platform language means that all types and sizes of computers, products, toys, in fact, anything imaginable capable of containing a computer chip can talk to each other. And so, in the real world, in remote control units, TVs, videos, Java programs will be used as an application in all sorts of equipment. I think that's where things are headed. Computer of today is just a computer and it's not anything beyond that. But the computer of tomorrow, it is going to be distributed geographically, it is going to be distributed the electronically, and so the definition of computer as a whole may change. Joining me now are Catherine McCoy, the past president of the Industrial Designers Society of America and a professor at the Institute of Design at the Illinois Institute of Technology, and Juan Carlos Soto, a manager of the Consumer Technologies Group of Sun Microsystems. Let me begin with you, Catherine. We've seen a lot of Japanese creativity and a lot of Japanese sensitivity to design. What is industrial design? Who practices industrial design? And is there a close link between the American designers and the Japanese designers? Uh, I like to think of industrial design as uh, sort of the mediation between um, culture and technology and uh, in, in the favor of the user and the consumer. So that um, we are able to interpret technology and, and collaborate with engineers and technologists as well as um, the manufacturers, marketers, and, and salespeople and, and bring all this together in something that is uh, useful for the consumer. Now, Juan Carlos is a designer of 
computing products. How would you interact as an industrial designer with a computer guy who's going to do the <laughs> software that allows a product or an object to change? We have a new dynamic. He can change the software inside a device. Which is really wonderful because industrial designers have uh, have found uh, in the past, in a more industrial era, that uh, we were always bumping up against the limitations of technology. And um, now with these sort of wonderful capabilities of high technology, um, we find that there's this really wonderful give and take between uh, computer people and industrial designers in, in uh, coming out with totally new product forms. Have you always been bound by by physicality, I mean, there's a material that makes this cup, and it has certain mm -hmm. characteristics. It's not plastic, it's porcelain, and it, you've, as an industrial designer, been drawing across this huge inventory of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly there are these things that change, these things mm -hmm. that talk to you and react to you. Is this a new experience for designers? That's a really great question, because we're finding that uh, products are dematerializing. It's really amazing, you know, where they're turning into service. Less hardware, more software. And of course, the user, the consumer, really wants the service. You know, they, they want the performance from the product. They buy a refrigerator to keep their food cold. They really don't care what the form is so much, as long as they get the service delivered. And um, we find now that because the, the hardware is uh, dematerializing through te uh, high technology that uh, the focus has sort of shifted somewhat away from materials and manufacturing which have a lot of finite physical limitations um, towards more of a, a matter of communications. Mm -hmm. So much has to do with communications mm -hmm. and data. Now Juan Carlos, you build things that communicate. What yeah. are your design criteria? Well, we think of it as a complete user experience. Uh, the hardware is just a way to deliver that experience. And it's a software that gives it that personality, that makes it something unique. Um, we care a lot about uh, making sure that that experience is a very positive one for the user of this thing. So while a refrigerator is a, a device in your kitchen, well, what else can it do for you? What else besides holding your food can it do? And how can you let that improve your life? And those are the kinds of thoughts that we start with when we design new products. Japan presents a fascinating blend of past, present, and future. There's no retro boom here. It has always been a retro boom, if you like. The Japanese have never broken from their past and changed things. They've always kept the traditional elements in just about all the art forms they have, in fact, have frozen in certain points of time. You get Beatles and you get James Dean's selling uh, Levi's, uh, that's Japan. The Beatles are popular, but they're classics in the States, but the Beatles are alive here. At industrial giant Mitsubishi Corporation, the Sociotech unit researches and plans products for the lifestyles of the future. Sociotech means uh, technology for uh, society. We believe uh, Java is a good way to share applications. In five or ten years, we believe every uh, electrical appliances or intelligent devices will be connected to a worldwide global network. At the Sharp Corporation in Osaka, software development drives new product creation. We are uh, designing not only outside uh, shape and form and colors, but also we are deeply uh, involved to uh, how to design uh, easy usage for average consumer. Let me try it. Because the uh, technology is so uh, complicated, so average user cannot operate without a uh, uh, interactive help. Sharp had its origins more than 80 years ago with the invention of the mechanical pencil. That search for miniaturization of technology continues today with compact, high-performance microchips, lightweight but tough plastics, and very compact batteries. This kind of a new product, it's a concentration of uh, different fields of uh, microtechnologies. Attention to detail has long been an important element in Japanese culture as in these traditional looms, where even the very threads are created by hand. 
they applied the same precision to high-tech devices. They didn't have the distinction that the West had between industrial design and commercial design. Industrial design is simply part of design that is not separate from artistic design. Please take a look at this card. Uh, this card is a plastic card with a small uh, piece of metal on it. And underneath, there is a, a semiconductor chip. So uh, we call this as a smart card. By combining miniaturization with networking capability, products like these, which link powerful computers to remote small objects, are leading towards a revolution in decentralization. The smart card applications have started with the uh, telephone card and based on the uh, memory card with the uh, uh, security logic circuit. And these days, the credit and debit card and even the uh, electronic money has become available. The kernel of the Java uh, environment is the applet. So if the smart card uh, can accept the applet, we can download the uh, software onto the card directly and no more uh, rely on the uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturer to uh, code in a very special manner for their smart card. The door is open for the end users. It's um, a credit card size PC and we have ported Java onto it so that it runs hot Java. So you have a credit card size hot Java platform that you connect the display to it, uh, mouse and keyboard to it. You have a full uh, PC there, which is just the size of a credit card. Firms like Applix have discovered the process of designing games and products has become more collaborative. A few years ago, actually, when you design like a software product, it was really the programmer or engineer was designing the product. Currently, most of our products are kind of designed by the design team, which are uh, basically not computer engineers. See, it's like, you know, building a car. The engine is real cool, hot, you know, high technology stuff, but the car itself is designed by someone who understands how they want to drive it and how they want to feel about it. The current PC and net software, including the web, are designed for user interfaces using keyboards and mouse. And obviously, home electronic equipment cannot assume people using keyboards and mouse in the living room. There was a time that everyone was excited about interactive televisions, but to tell the truth, you know, most people just sit there and eat potato chips to watch televisions. And they don't want to, you know, select a story every like a few minutes. And our company is kind of focused to these more passive kind of systems where the user are basically want to just receive information or want to get entertained. My next vision is that these net capable or PC capable home devices are going to turn into furniture. Something like a table having a touch panel built in that can access your intelligent TV system to browse your websites or to tune your uh, digital 300 channel TV programs. On the other hand, using PCs and workstations, you want to have control over everything and you want to do lots of compl complicated things. So we think that the technology is going to go into two uh, directions. Years ago, uh, one of the founders at Sun, Bill Joy, said that the future for those of us that walk around, those that are mobile, will carry about two kilos worth of stuff. Hmm. Now, a watch, part of that, or a cell phone. And if you look at almost any person that's traveling through an airport that yeah. stands at the security device and empties their pockets, <laughs> mm -hmm. they'll come out with a telephone, with an organizer, with maybe a radio link that would link them onto some, uh, um, uh, onto the internet with a device. They'll have a watch. Um, they store their money in small credit cards, uh, smart cards. We're adding more and more functionality in some sense to ourselves as mobile nomadic people. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when design moves into clothing, when this intelligence moves into jewelry? What, and these are services people want. Uh, is that a focus of industrial design? Yes, yes, very much. And it's really interesting to think of products and alternative forms to these hard black boxes 
that we've been seeing all these years. And so they can become things that are very personal and also cultural expressions. And I think this is uh, uh, an important part of the industrial designer's role also is to understand uh, users' values and uh, cultural rituals and to try to embed these services into things that are meaningful for users. I think that's a really important point because you can have the neatest whiz-bang gadget and somebody may buy it as a novelty, but they're not going to continue to use it unless it provides some function to them. And it's got to fit into what those people need to be doing. If you're on a plane and you're stuck in your seat for two to ten hours, that's a productive time for many people. These devices that enable them to stay productive and take advantage of that time is exactly why they use them. When a user says that the point of these smart objects should be to make life more pleasurable, Till now, most of the computer interface that people know is not pleasurable at all. They're ugly. You have to type some obscure thing. They don't react to you in any way. They break for some. You, you can offend them easily, and they don't do what you want, and you, you don't understand them. Error, you know. <laughs> now, this is a result of the PC industry and the computer industry as a whole just rapidly throwing things together without design, without a thought of how the human being might use them, then trying to repair it later. Do you see any rejection by customers of things that aren't pleasurable and a turn toward things that are? I think that's demonstrated in the marketplace every day. Um, it's interesting how, you know, think about when you use your computer, you can, when you're flying along, you gain this wonderful sense of competency. You know, I'm the master of the universe, <laughs> and all of a sudden you have a system error, and you get this adrenaline rush, you know, and you're reduced to a, like a blubbering idiot, you know, and you can't talk to anyone for minutes. And um, I think what we need are products that enhance the sense of competency in people, you know, that really make them uh, not only in, in, uh, in actuality more productive, but also make them you know, feel more productive and more self-confident and capable. And I think that would really enrich people's lives. Technology itself has no mission. Yes. The mission should be, uh, be given by the man. Yes. That's why the technology is, is a blind man. GK Design, founded by Buddhist monk Kenji Ekowan, is the world's largest industrial design firm, responsible for numerous products that have become cultural icons worldwide. GK is firmly focused on the human-machine interface. Among Ekowan's current projects, these solar-powered balls which emulate human neural response. Uh, 400 years ago, you know, uh, Renaissance you know, has happened in Europe. Huh? That time, you know, big, strong authority, you know, the powerful authority press the people. Eh? Now the same thing has happened in this age. So this means the technology becomes super higher, you know. So let's come back to human size, human touch. One of the options I think is to use the voice navigation system as both input and output. All you have to do is talk to your system. But of course, sometimes you don't want to talk to a machine because it looks very awkward. So I think we're going to need various input devices, including a touch-sensitive uh, coffee table input system. The Japanese language is a quite a complicated language to communicate ideas directly. And throughout the ages, they have overcome this by a very much heavier emphasis on visual rather than verbal non-verbal rather than verbal communications. With embedded technology, we are being subtly surrounded with familiar objects that now have computer capabilities. These game machines are definitely have CPUs inside. There's a computer inside, but you might not notice it. We believe Java gives a consumer very easy to use interface compared to the current technology. When a housewife uses a computer, it's very convenient to put an uh, easy-to-use computer uh, in the kitchen to have a uh, computer function on the refrigerator. All the sources of information are coming from digital networking and perhaps cable TV, so it's just a matter of which devices you want to use. 
If you're working on a word processing project, then you'll probably be better off um, using your PCs. The Japanese tend to be very mobile because of lack of space. They cannot be fixed to one space as much as the spatial uh, luxuries of the American home or the American office. So they tend to continue to work uh, outside that fixed space, but they have to carry that space with them. And so notebooks or all those miniaturized devices are in fact helping them to do that. The ultimate in mobile connectivity is a car multimedia system that includes voice communication, navigation, audio video, and soon internet access. It's a product of Zanavi, a joint venture between Nissan, the automaker, and Hitachi, an electronics giant. Keyword is communication. So navigation system is a standalone system right now. So all data is in CD-ROM and inside the vehicle. Sometimes people want to make a trip plan. For example, the people go to AAA office. These things is automatically done by information center and send the data and send that program by Java via cell phone to the navigation system. That's a real-time information. Here in Japan, it's an accepted business philosophy that new technologies can help create highly profitable new markets. Because they are, there are no uh, competitors in the uh, created market, so we have to meet a different uh, worldwide market. But uh, high technology can open every place of the market. The philosophies underlying Japanese product development and design have now become global. Java developer Sun Microsystems is now an inventor of technologies for consumer products that go far beyond its traditional computer workstation market. If you can provide a device which you can open up and then just plug into the phone line and it takes care of the network connection itself, all of a sudden you have great ease of use. Here you have a device that somebody can pick up, use very easily, use without thinking about it or without an instruction book. That makes it very different from a computer, and I think that's what consumers demand. While some products like the Tamagotchi may quickly become popular, the market usually determines success over time. Technology may open the door to innovation, but it is only the means to an end. The consumer is not only concerned about looking at products to improve their quality of life, they're looking at products that will enhance the enjoyment of life. They're not simply making things more convenient, they're not simply making things more uh, uh, functional, they're making things more pleasurable. We've talked about using these intelligent devices in the kitchen. How much farther can we go? And what other areas are there where intelligent devices might change the way we live? Well, I've been reading um, descriptions of new refrigerators uh, with uh, networked, embedded uh, computing in them. And we, we have to ask the question, do we even need this? It seems like uh, sometimes um, you wonder whether you need uh, new technologies for things that we seem to be doing fairly well with as they are. You know, my dumb refrigerator keeps my, my food cold pretty well. But I'm, I'm quite interested in, in how these things might begin to be uh, adopted by the average user. And it, it strikes me, for instance, that um, the smart refrigerator that can uh, inventory your food and be connected to um, uh, a recipe center and um, your shopping experience uh, might be really immediately useful for medical situations. Um, for instance, um, people with dietary, special dietary needs like diabetics or heart patients have really difficult time uh, keeping track of their nutritional status and, and um, eating the correct things. It really has a lot to do with how well people recover from conditions also in, in their medical treatment. So um, at IIT, for instance, several different student projects have been working with um, smart devices, both hardware and software, that could very, very well be connected to um, other uh, cooking and food storage and preparation shopping devices that would help them um, follow their nutritional orders from their doctors much more accurately and would help their recovery much more quickly. So if you're leaving the chicken out too long on the, <laughs> on the counter, the refrigerator would say, 
put that chicken <laughs> away. This well, is or if you decide that you want that dessert, and um, you know you can use your uh, uh, software uh, device to say, up, oh, you know, you've reached your limit of sugar intake for the day. And um, barcoding, uh, networking, and uh, computing can all uh, integrate these functions really well and help you obey your doctor a lot better. There's the individual use, but when you aggregate across all the refrigerators and realize that refrigerators might be 20 or 30 percent of total electrical demand, and on a hot day they all turn on, <laughs> it's possible to bring down the total cost to society of that energy by making them a little smarter, letting them stay off mm -hmm. for an extra half That's hour right, at yeah. noon, bringing the peak load for electricity mm -hmm. down, saving billions of dollars in investment in electrical generation. So there's an interplay between the individual use and the societal use of energy converted into mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. for human beings. But uh, do I want my refrigerator talking to your refrigerator? <laughs> <laughs> you might want to have your refrigerator talking to your control point in your house. I think that there's a limit about how far we want others intruding mm -hmm. on what we do. There's some interesting issues there, aren't there's there? A very, yeah. the, the portal device should protect me from unwarranted invasions. Mm -hmm. What if the police want to know what I do with my That's refrigerator right. late <laughs> at night? Do I want them to know that? <laughs> so uh, there may be a new component of the services provided that allows you to control how much is known about your use of a particular device. Yeah, exactly. In fact, that touches on the subject of security, which mm -hmm. is a really important thing. Um, this whole security thing needs to be looked at very closely, and there are people working that way today. I'd like to thank our guests for discussing this new world of emerging small objects, embedded objects, objects that are bringing the world around us alive. In using these objects, remember, the machine is the manual. The use should be self-evident. The designers, all of us, are creating a new world with these devices. It's up to us to explore that world. Thanks for joining us. I'm John Gage.